Uh, hi, everyone. So uh, with this slide, I'm just trying to give everyone a seizure. Um, I, I'm an engineer at the Washington Post, and I work on a, uh, I work on a tool called Page Builder, and it lets newsrooms tell their stories in new and interesting ways. Uh, these days, most of those stories are uh, read on the web, um, but perhaps unsurprisingly, most of that traffic comes from mobile devices. But here's a fun fact that you might not know. Newspapers actually existed before the internet. So if, I, <laughs> if I'm doing the math right, the Washington Post has been around for about 140 years. And when the Post began publishing back in 1877, the paper only had four pages and cost three cents. And that's a really far cry from the Sunday edition that exists today. So let's fast forward about 100 years to 1996. This is when the WashingtonPost.com first launched. And for a 90s website, it looks pretty good. It's really hard to compare this to a modern website because uh, CSS and web fonts, they didn't really exist the way we have them today. Most websites use what we called web safe fonts. And that was typography that was limited to the fonts that users already had installed on their computer. And if I remember correctly, if you don't specify a font, it comes up as Times New Roman. And there was a lot of Times New Roman back in the 90s. The 90s was a special time for web development. And partly, this was because we had no idea what we were doing. So these days, when we start a project, there's probably a CLI for it. And you're probably already debating, like, should I use Angular, or should I use React, or Vue, or Web Components? Uh, you're probably thinking about whether you're going to use Babel, or Webpack, or Prepack. Uh, but none of these tools existed in the 90s. We've basically been winging it since the internet was invented. And that's because we didn't have patterns or expectations for what the web is supposed to look like. For example, this is a screenshot of the Pepsi website in 1996. Um, it looks cutting edge, I guess. Um, the effect kind of reminds me of like this futuristic heads-up display or what we thought the future would look like. Uh, it was probably designed for 640 by 480, though, because it doesn't really translate to the displays we have today. <laughs> and if you told me 20 years ago that the smartphone I have in my pocket would have a 1080p screen built into it, I probably wouldn't believe you. Back then, people just tried things. If it was cool, you just like right click, you view the source, and figure out how they did it. So I remember this one trick. So before we had CSS and responsive web design, we had the spacer.gif. Uh, Zach Holman calls it the one by one GIF, but it was this hack. And it was amazing. Uh, it was literally a single transparent pixel that you set as the source of an image tag. And then you'd basically scale the, the width or the height to make a, an invisible image that would push your HTML elements around the screen. And this would let you make incredibly complex layouts without CSS. Fortunately, we have CSS now. But I think it's really cool to look back at how the web has evolved. And a lot has changed in the past 20 years. So mobile phones have faster CPUs and more RAM than the desktops that existed in the 90s. What this means for us now is that we expect a lot from modern websites. The web is no longer just a framework or a network of hyperlinked documents. The modern web is a platform for application delivery. For example, Google Documents is a website that we go to using a URL, but it's also a full-fledged productivity suite inside your web browser. So if we take a closer look at the post current website, there are a lot of features that go beyond a simple HTML document. We have interactive features like, like quizzes or polls or comments. And we have personalization features like recommendations based on the articles that you read. We also have personalization features like recommendations. Or, uh, we also have push notifications, which I think are one of the more interesting features because this is kind of where, where the line blurs between the web and features that we see in native mobile apps. And at the post, we also treat each feature as a component. So each piece of content that gets rendered to the user is internally treated as an atomic unit of rendering. So for example, the home page might consist of hundreds of individual components that are eventually stitched together on the server before the HTML is ever sent to the end user. And this model lets us encapsulate the functionality that we want into front-end components and supporting back-end services that we can scale independently. From a top-down view, our publishing platform is powered by tons of services that are written in various languages. 
Uh, some of them are JavaScript, some of them are Python, some of them are Golang, some of them are in Scala. And while the diversity of our tech stack kind of sounds excessive, the differences in deployment are really abstracted away because we use Linux containers as the common deployment artifact. So when a team ships a new release, a build server creates a container image and pushes it to a central container registry. And then our automated deployment system deploys either the latest version or we can roll back to any previous version that was ever deployed. So containers as a concept allow our developers to choose the best tool for the job while allowing deployments to be agnostic to the technology that we select. With our current infrastructure, we can deploy new releases with zero downtime during the middle of the day. But that wasn't always the case. So back in 2011, the Post website was powered by a monolithic vendor source CMS. And during this time, the internet helped a lot of startups and digital media companies flourish. But it also posed a major threat to traditional newspaper business model. If we're going to survive this change, we can't keep doing things that no longer work. For the Post, this was a catalyst for trying new things. So here are the things that we knew. We knew we needed to release features faster, and we needed to experiment. And we needed to iterate based on the data that we collect in those experiments. And one problem for us was that when you have software that you buy from a vendor, their product schedule doesn't really line up with yours. But we can't let that affect our ability to deliver new features. We wanted to reduce our dependence on the legacy system. So we did what every developer loves to do. We created a new one. Uh, we, this, <laughs> This is actually pretty terrifying because like, once you decide to build a new system, you have all these questions like, how do I support years of existing requirements? And will there be breaking changes? Probably. Uh, when, when it's all done, how do we deploy the new system to production? And this path is, this path is extremely risky. It's, it's paved with good intentions, but even those good intentions can be ruined by poor execution. We had a lot of bumps, but in the end, we learned a lot about uh, deploying systems at scale. So how many of you are familiar with software design patterns? It's awesome. So design patterns are kind of like recipes for software design problems. And this book is affectionately referred to as the Gang of Four book. And one pattern that's mentioned in the book is the adapter pattern. So you can use this pattern to wrap existing classes or objects to make them work with another interface or something, something else that you have. And you can kind of think of it like a power adapter. And if you've traveled internationally, you may have experienced a situation where you can't plug in your laptop or your phone because your charger doesn't fit. An adapter lets you use the power outlets in that country without modifying the power outlet or buying a new charger. In our case, the power outlet was this mission critical application. It didn't provide the interface that we needed. So we took the concept and we wrapped the system by writing an adapter that converted the proprietary data format into something usable by our other applications. That adapter transformed the content from the legacy system and turned it into JSON. And what this does was it allowed our front-end clients, like our website or our mobile apps, to use the adapter's API as a standard interface. With the adapter in place, the next step was to decouple the model in the view. Because with a monolithic CMS, the content is typically stored in a database. But they also support templating theming to allow readers to read your content the way you want them to see it. So in this example, the content is the article that the user wants to read, but the view could be uh, a Kindle, it could be an iPhone, an Android, it could be Facebook Instant Articles, Apple News, or accelerated mobile pages. Since the adapter pattern lets us provide a uniform interface, we created a separate rendering service to replace the, the view layer. The rendering service had two important goals. The first was to decouple front-end developers from the CMS tech stack. And one problem with working at a monolithic CMS is that if you want to extend it or if you want to add plugins or new features, you typically have to write code in the language that the CMS is written in. But if we can decouple the rendering from the management of content, then web developers don't need to know the inner workings of WordPress or, or Drupal to create a website. So, this paradigm lets front-end developers write in HTML, JavaScript, CSS, languages that they like writing in. But more importantly, it reduces the footprint of the legacy CMS. And once the CMS is no longer rendering user-facing content, it basically becomes a collaborative text editor. 
So for example, if we wanted to just throw out WordPress, we could, and you know, we could build a new thing with Rails or Django. We don't have to rewrite all our templating to be compatible with the new system. So once we had the new rendering service, how did we know that was ready for production? One of the problems with testing is that test environments never seem to match production. Either the database or the data doesn't match, or the test scripts, they don't reflect what users are actually doing. Another problem is that the development environment never sees the same volume or the same type of requests that you see in production. I think the best way to know whether a change is gonna break your production environment is by testing with production traffic. We use an open source tool called Go Replay, and what this does is it allows us to record HTTP traffic and send it to a mirror of our production environment. This lets us test our systems with real data and real traffic so that we can be more confident in changes to our code, to our configuration, or our infrastructure. The way we achieve this confidence is by measuring changes and looking at the delta between the metrics that we already have in production. So for example, if we have a release candidate that has a fix that improves response latency, the, the expected outcome is that in both environments, you should receive the same response. But in the canary environment or the environment with the release candidate, it should be faster. And that's the expected output. So this type of testing lets us find production issues before we deploy to production. But now that we know the system is ready, how do we transition to it? It's very risky to flip the switch and send all of our traffic to the new system. But we can roll it out one feature at a time. And Martin Fowler called this the, the strangler application pattern. The analogy comes from a strangler fig, which grows in the canopy of a larger tree until it sends roots to the ground. And over time, the fig grows, and it overtakes the original tree. But in this process, it also kills it. In this diagram, you can imagine that each vine is a microservice. And as we're releasing new features, parts of the old system are being replaced with, with the new services until the legacy system no longer exists. We can implement this pattern using a reverse proxy. We, we use Nginx a lot, um, but media sites tend to naturally bucket content using the URL to structure resources. So for example, slash politics will take you to the politics section, and slash sports will take you to the sports section. And using a reverse proxy, we can route specific requests to the new system, but letting everything else fall back to the legacy system. And this allows both systems to coexist in production while the transition is in progress. And as the new system matures, we can route more and more traffic to it until it's serving all the requests. At this point, the transition is complete because once all requests are going to the new system, you can pretty much turn off the old one. But what if we want to test the feature that lives at the same URL? Unlike a printed newspaper, the web allows us to experiment and iterate extremely quickly. One to technique that we use is called A-B testing. So A-B testing is a controlled experiment where two versions live side by side. So version A is a control group, and version B is the variant that we're testing. You'll often hear about this with respect to user engagement metrics on like photos or, or whether people click on articles. But in the case of testing the entire system, you can designate the legacy system as a control group and the new system as the variant. And to set up the test, we use cookies. So like, you can set a cookie to opt a subset of users into the test group. And users that don't have the cookie are automatically sent to the control group. At the end of the experiment, the successful version becomes the default experience for all users. And hopefully, the su su successful version is the new system. In the context of replacing a legacy system with a new system, you only have two choices. But we don't have to limit experimentation to a binary decision. To optimize content, we use another form of testing called the, it's based on the multi-armed bandit problem. So in this problem, imagine that there's a gambler sitting in front of a row of slot machines. Each slot machine pays out a different reward based on some unknown probability distribution. If the player wants to maximize their reward, it's in their best interest to play all the slot machines. Because you want to figure out, or you want to estimate what the payout is for each machine. In this phase, we call it ex exploration. Here, the players are, are trying to identify which machine is the best. Based on the information that the player gathers, they'll eventually focus on a single machine that they think is the best one. And this phase is called exploitation. 
The goal of a multi-arm bandit algorithm is to balance the time you spend in exploration versus exploitation while maximizing your total reward. Internally, we've got a service called Bandito that does this. When an article is published, we give editors the ability to create a test with multiple variants. And you can, you can have multiple variants of uh, headlines or promotional photos or other pieces of content. And if we use a slot machine analogy, each variant can be seen as a different machine with an unknown potential for reward. What the algorithm does is it starts by exploring the potential for each variant. It does this by evaluating user engagement metrics related to the test. So once the algorithm determines the winning variant, it exploits that potential by serving it much more frequently. Unlike A-B testing, the winner of a multi-arm bandit test is never served 100% of the time. And this is because an infrequently played slot machine still has the possibility of winning the jackpot. So you want to make sure that you continue to explore a bit while you exploit the, the most profitable machine. In this example, the, the first two variants only defer by headline. But the last variant introduces the author's photo, which in increased the click-through rate a lot more. And this is likely because users tend to connect more with pictures of people versus pictures of inanimate objects. And what's really cool about this is the information that we learn from these experiments, they can come back and help us create more engaging content. So given the task of modernizing a legacy system, it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking that if you rebuild it with a new technology like React or Node, it's going to be a lot better than what you had before. But maybe the problem isn't the technology that we choose. A common theme that we found was that that by allowing ourselves to experiment, we learn something new about our problem space. The worst thing that could happen is that if it doesn't work, you just stop doing it. If you stop doing the things that don't work and you keep doing the things that do work, eventually you'll head in the right direction. And at a conceptual level, this makes sense. But there's a big difference between stating the objective and implementing it. At the post, we spent a lot of engineering resources making it less risky to experiment and faster to iterate. But even so, this transition didn't happen overnight. Our journey looked a lot like this road. It was a long uphill climb, and it goes back and forth, kind of like changing requirements, which will happen. And modernizing a legacy systems is both difficult and risky, but we found ways to reduce that risk. The adapter pattern helped us bridge the gap between the interface that we had and the interface that we wanted. And once we figured out how to decouple the view layer from the legacy system, the Strangler application pattern gave us a way to reduce its footprint. By fine-tuning the way we experiment, we learned how to move fast and not break things. We found that replaying production traffic into a canary environment gave us a lot more confidence in the changes that we made. A-B testing gave us a framework for comparing the success of a change. <coughs> But we found for content that multi-arm bandit testing gave us a lot more flexibility in how we optimize user engagement. So these are some of the tools that helped us shorten the feedback loop and reduce risk while building our new publishing system. And depending on your business or your domain, the same tools might not work for you. But if you find yourself modernizing a legacy system, I hope that some of this information was helpful. If you're interested in learning more about our engineering team or what we're doing, you can follow us on Twitter. We're at WAPO Engineering. Or you can check out our blog at developer.washingtonpost.com. I'm Chris Gwen, and thanks for coming. <laughs>